Friends, we are here today with Ruby Kaur, a poet, author, and so much more. We're talking all about her journey to finding her, her voice, her art, taking it to levels that she never knew was possible. Rupi, you want to add to this? Maria, I'm so excited to have this open, honest, and thoughtful conversation with you. I don't think I could have it with anybody else. Oh, thank you so much. All right, friends, don't forget to hit subscribe. It's going to be a good one. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we do here every single day. Our quote for today, do not look for healing at the feet of those who broke you. Ooh, and the second one. <laughs> I've, been on two, I've been on a two journey recently. This one's so good. I know. If you were born with the weakness to fall, you were born with the strength to rise. Both of those are from our guest today, Rupi Kaur, Heal Squad. You are in for a treat today. Kelsey killed it with this booking. Um, she's like, you're going to love her. You're going to love her. I've been reading her books, blah, blah, blah. And then I did my homework on her and I'm like, I love her. I love her. I love her. She's going to be amazing on the show. So she is a poet, friends, and um, her poetry is uh, definitely surrounding mental health and finding strength and surviving and thriving and so much more. She's going to empower us to maybe pick up our pens and start writing ourselves. Um, she originally published her poems on Instagram and then just started crushing. In 2014, her book, Milk and Honey, um, sold over 2.5 million copies in 25 languages, and it spent 77 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. I was like 11 or 12. <laughs> I mean, both a long time. 77. So. Holy Crazy. moly. Uh, her book, Sun and Her Flowers, which explores her Punjabi Canadian heritage, reached to the top three on the Amazon bestseller list, along with Dan Brown and Oprah Winfrey. Uh, not bad company to be in. And she was named one of Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2018. Her fourth book, Healing Through Words, is coming out. Um, she is going to definitely be, uh, a really wonderful and engaging conversation. I know that for sure. Before we get into that, um, Monday motivations and intentions. I don't know if you guys heard it in the potluck Saturday this weekend. We threw one at you. Uh, Kevin has been wanting to launch this for quite some time. And, uh, it was Pooja's kind of last mission to help him get it off the ground. And so, uh, Monday motivations and intentions are basically our new way for you to kind of start your week. If you only have like eight to 10 minutes, uh, the shows will be very quick um, and really kind of set the tone for your week. So um, might be something cool to just start the day with, and then you can listen to our Monday show as you normally would. But it's kind of like a punchy, quick, little something to take into your week. It's like your, your Monday morning sermon. And I've also been inspired to throw into that feed some little kind of encouragement slash inspiration for the week. So I've been taking notes on things that every time I'm advising someone on something or anytime kind of one of those aha moments comes into my life and my brain, I write it down. So I've been accumulating. So you get those little kind of gems thrown in there. Hopefully they're gems. <laughs> they always are. And so I'll be throwing those in there. So it's in another feed because we couldn't overwhelm this feed um, under Better Together because we already have five or six shows that usually end up on here. So go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe to Monday Motivations and Intentions. We're updating the logo. That's just a temporary logo. Um, and uh, we're open to feedback, by the way, if anybody has good ideas. But um, down the, or subscribe to it there, and um, you can get it at Spotify as well. So don't forget to do that. Um, and yeah, I know uh, we have a lot to get to with Rupee, so we probably should just get right into it. Um, Heal Squad, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be chatting with Rupee Core. Hey! Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing really well, especially after seeing your beautiful face. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. We're so excited to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This means so much. Thank you. Oh my gosh, of course. So you're on tour right now? 
I am. Yeah, I had a show last night, and then today's an off day. We just got to uh, Birmingham, and I'm going to tomorrow. Alabama. Yeah. How many tour dates? No, no, are no. Doing? In the I'm in London, uh, the the UK. Oh, you're in the UK. <laughs> well, another Birmingham. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how many tour dates are you are you doing? Um, I don't know how many dates, but it finishes in April. So I'm did most of the U S already. I'm currently working through UK and Europe and then coming back in November to finish Canada and the U S and then I'll do other continents from January to April. So Whoa. I've like signed up for something that <laughs> I don't know if I'll sign up for again. Ruby, you're great. like a rolling stone. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really cool. It's been like really cool to meet so many people from around the world and um and it stays like interesting and challenging that way cuz generally people respond the same, but there are some nuances depending on the location that you're in where it you know like things change and um it's been cool. Well, in some cities I imagine they have to translate you, right? It's, I think so. Well, let's see. Like I haven't like next year I'll be in Brazil. I'll be in Mexico City. So I don't I don't know. Interesting. There was uh, last time I was in Barcelona, um, the young woman who translates my poetry into Spanish. She's my age and she's a she's like a incredible Spanish poet. And so I actually had her on stage with me and like I would read and then she would translate and read as well, which was really fun. So do you travel with somebody consistently? Like, do you have an assistant or a buddy or a friend, somebody that comes with you? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I have two of my team members who've worked with me for about four years are with me. One is my assistant and the other one is, she's kind of like a creative director, but she'll like do photography. She'll also do glam because it's her passion. And then we have a tour manager as well who's traveling with us. Did you ever in your wildest dreams think you would be doing a poetry tour? No, I am still confused. I, <laughs> my brain still hasn't. I'm like, what's going on? Like I was telling the folks at the show last night. Um, I was like, I can't believe you're like, you, you bought tickets to be here. It's so wild. Cause sometimes I'm on stage. And it's like child traumatic childhood memories. And I feel like, oh my God, it's a school assembly again. And all these people are being forced to sit there and watch me. And then I have to like catch myself and be like, no, 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 we're not going there. No, no, no. They're enjoying this and they want to be here. And um, then everybody laughs that I'm thinking these ridiculous thoughts. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> like no matter what we accomplish, there's always going to be that little imposter syndrome that's kind of just, because it's so shocking, right? It's not, also, I remember um, there was a violinist who was on Dancing with the Stars after me. And, you know, everyone told her she was terrible. She was never going to make it, whatever. And then she was selling out arenas just to play the violin. I forget. Do you remember her name, Kelsey? Lindsay. Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, I forget her last Sterling. name. Sterling. Yes. Yes. Yep. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And I get the chills because, you know, you think there's only one way to do things sometimes, right? But like mm -hmm. when you open your mind, why not have a poetry mm -hmm. tour? And why mm -hmm. not come see a violinist? And it's just, um, it's really kind of the world is your oyster and you you can do whatever you want. I don't know. It's it's so inspiring. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's It's really cool to so many people who come to the shows they're like we don't know what to expect this is the first ever poetry show that I'm ever going to so it's it's been really cool to kind of figure out what this genre looks like because mm -hmm. folks really know what to expect when they go to stand-up comedy and they know what to expect when they're going to watch a concert with like their favorite musician but this idea of experiencing a poetry show like I mean, I've been doing this for 13 years and it's been wild to think like it started off as something I would go on stage and I would perform a single piece for five minutes. But then over those 13 years, I really had to learn how to fill up 90 minutes as folks wanted to fly me to different places to perform. And so I've like kind of created this like weird thing, but <laughs> it just feels like honestly, when I'm up there is like all we're doing is connecting. 
And that is the thing that has the room buzzing like I'm breaking the fourth wall we're having conversations and it's it's like a different show every night yeah it's cathartic I'm sure for the audience to come hear you because your story is so powerful and uh, by the way having immigrant parents I love the the nod to them when you're like sorry mom (laughs) like when you're being (laughs) honest about something that they would be cringing that you're talking about in public how have they evolved over the 13 years? I'm curious. Um, so when we, when I was first performing, uh, my parents, so my dad is like such an activist, you know, like he's such a revolutionary. I come from a family where we're, we're Punjabi Sikh. Uh, my community survived a genocide in 1984 that was um, committed by the Indian state. And so like, I knew that at the age of six years old, you know what I mean? And like, so these were the conversations we were having, like human rights are always at the center of all of our conversations growing up. And it's so funny because then when I started getting involved in activism work in high school, my dad was like, not about it. I think because like he was then triggered as a refugee. He was like, wait, no, like, I don't want you to experience the things that I experienced. Um, And, you know, the paranoia and all of the things like being watched. um, I think all of that was very triggering for him. So he didn't like that I was, you know, raising my voice and speaking up about certain things. And so he was like, I don't know what you're doing at these poetry shows. My mom would drop me off, but every time they would drop me, it would be a giant fight. Cause he's like, why can't you just study? Like every hour of your day should just be going to study so that you can have a better life than I did. You know, the typical story. Mm-hmm. Um, and it switched when I also never really explained to them what I was doing because I also didn't know what I was doing. Like, it, spoken word is not something that they understand. But when I self published my first book, they didn't know I was going to self publish because I wasn't looking for permission. So once it was out, I kind of like came home from college and I like put it in front of him. And from that day, everything shifted because like books and literature is something that he can understand mm. and that he like does respect. So then suddenly there was this entire shift and then everybody was on board. Um, but it's been, it's been amazing. I mean, mom was always there. My siblings, they were in like high school and middle school when I self published and, um, they would come to all my events and I'd be on stage and they'd be hand selling copies of milk and honey at the back. This is like almost 10 years ago now, but yeah, it's it's so wild. wild You self published a book and that book became a huge bestseller. So what advice do you have for people that are scared to maybe self-publish? Because think about it, even I'll, I'll tell you, even the top people that I'm around and that are super successful already have established brands. When it comes to their book, the terror mm-hmm. that runs through everybody because they have a pressure to become number one because of who they mm-hmm. are and the amount of money they have to spend on marketing and promotion mm-hmm. and big boxes with all the toys and trinkets that they send you along with the book to get you excited and all this just to attempt to do something that you did on your own. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a big feat. Um, Yeah. You know, it's for me, it wasn't a big thing because I was, I was working from outside the industry So the idea of like marketing and PR boxes, like those were so out of reach that I was just like a 20 year old who was like, wow, I have like 3000 followers on Instagram who are asking me, do you have a book published? And, you know, just curious and really in touch with my creativity. And I knew very quickly as I started to ask my creative writing professor and as I started to submit my poetry to anthologies and journals, I think I clued in very quickly that this book wasn't going to be published in the traditional way because I was told consistently, nobody publishes poetry. There's no market for it. Like your best bet is to maybe get published by a journal. That's what I was told consistently. And I, I, I was just kind of, I sat back and I was like, okay, I come from a working class immigrant family I don't know anybody who doesn't have like a factory job. 
like, I don't even know where to begin. And I'm, there were so many things stacked against me that uh, when my professor said, don't self publish, he said, don't do it because once you self publish, you lose all respect, like Hmm. the literary community, like forget about it. And, and I was sitting there and I was thinking, but they already don't care about me and they already don't see me and I'm already invisible. So I'm just going to do it anyway. And so in that way, that decision was easy, but there is that fearlessness that comes, I think with like this naivety when you're like 20 years old that, um, yeah, you almost like don't know any better. So you just do these wild things. So, so cool. And so I just think, uh, I love hearing those stories. We all do because you you make the impossible possible. Mm, thank you. Thank and you. it's a great benchmark for people to see that the traditional route isn't the only route. There are all different ways to do things. I saw that mm-hmm. you designed your own cover for your book and I did the same thing with my first book. I went oh out, we, we you know, created the cover. My husband and I were like, okay, we're going to do this ourselves because they don't get us. They don't understand us. Um, they already told us we were writing a bad book and, oh. you know, wanted us to go in a completely different direction. I'm like, but this is, this is what came out of my heart. Like, this is what mm-hmm. I wanted to share with people. And yeah. so I was like, I'd rather fail on my own accord than fail Ooh. going your way. Oof. And Absolutely. so um, just like you, I had reached out to some people in my life that I respected teachers and things like that. I'm like, does this help you in any way? Is this good? And they're like, oh my God, it's amazing. I'm like, no, tell me the yeah. truth. And that's when I realized, okay, I'm going to go forward my way. But I designed my own cover as well. And my book, they told me never to even consider New York Times because I was not, you know, somebody that should be able to make it there. And I was number three in the hardest category, they said, of vice and self-help. And so there we stayed. I think it was 11 or 12 weeks. When I saw 77 weeks, I was like, holy shit, that's insane. But but it's, it's these stories that just continue to tell people, like, if you have something to share... You got to just keep pushing through. It's the ones who quit that never yes. see what it could have been, right? My favorite mm-hmm. wrestler in the world, his, my favorite quote from him is, you never lose unless you quit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Wow. And it's so be- like, that's so beautiful to hear from you because I think we look up to these, like, these folks who we go to, whether they're in the industry or they're gatekeepers. And, you know, you think... But we don't all fit into one formula and you have to remember, I have to remember that they are functioning with one formula for them that works within the system of capitalism. But like you and I and artists, like we have this voice within us and it's that voice that gets you on that list, even though their formula says that you can. Mm-hmm. And like, that is, that's it. That's the magic. That's the only thing you have to follow, which is that, that voice that speaks through you call it the heart I call it I don't know my inner voice or my inner world yeah I do think yeah I want to go back to the immigrant parent thing because um I've always been so fascinated by what uh kind of first gen has to do you're technically not first gen because you were born there right Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. although they say you're first gen and I'm technically second gen because my parents immigrated here and I was born here but whatever those are I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a it's an interesting little thing, but um, and now I'm already losing my track of of what I was going to go with this. Um, oh, it's it's being able to when you know when you come from immigrant families, there's so much pride, and mm-hmm. to be able to be as raw and honest as you were about your experiences um, takes a lot of courage because. It's hard enough to do it with everybody else, but your parents are the hardest in some ways, I feel like. So how did you get over that hurdle? Or maybe it wasn't a hurdle. I don't know. I mean, you know, I never ever, well, it was, so when I first started writing and I was performing, I didn't have to worry about it because my parents never came to my shows. You know what I mean? So I was like, it's fine. I can say whatever I want. They'll never hear it. Did you not then, invite them or did they just not come because they didn't want to? Cause I find that interesting. <laughs> they never came to your shows. My mom, my mom would, 
but my dad was always working like all the time. He's a truck driver. And he, I mean, we were a family of six, four kids, my mom and him, my, my mom, my mom didn't work. Um, she took care of us. And so he was always working and like never at any, any event, whether it was like birthday parties or graduation or that kind of thing. Wow. So that's kind of why he never came. Um, well, your mom had five but, other kids to deal with. So that's like 50 full-time jobs. <laughs> 50 full-time jobs. <laughs> so she would, she would come. And then, um, she, the thing with my mom is also like, she's just like, looks at everybody else and she's like, yeah, they're enjoying it. So this must be cool. But she doesn't understand, like she understands English, but she doesn't understand English. Like she, cause she never worked outside of the home. Mm -hmm. Um, she, she can watch movies. She gets the gist of it, but she's still not comfortable, um, in her comprehension of it and communicating in English. And I started to become afraid when my Tumblr following and my Instagram following kind of started to grow a little bit. And this is way before the books were published, but I used to be so afraid because I wrote about um, abusive relationships. I'd been in a lot. I wrote about them a lot and I shared it um, online and I would have nightmares that this man doesn't even make sense now. But I mean, at the time when you're just so afraid, I would have nightmares that he's going to like print out all of these poems and he's going to go to my house and like, just like leave them at my parents' doors. And my parents were going to be like, wait, what is this? Um, and did like, they that know never about, happened. Did they know about the abusive relationships? No, they didn't. Mm -hmm. Because in my community, of course, <laughs> I shouldn't even be dating. Yeah. You know? well, so, I didn't want to assume, but I already knew the answer. <laughs> yeah. So that was a whole thing. And I mean, in hindsight, I don't even think if he even did that, I, my parents would be like, well, what is this printout? We don't understand. But then when the book came out, Elizabeth Gilbert calls it mysticism but I can't like I didn't I know I published that book but for those few years there was something else working through me and she says that um there is this mysticism that sort of guides us sometimes it almost feels like something magical is working through us and without even thinking about the consequences suddenly the book was published and um you never thought about it no, I never thought about it until it was almost too late. And then I was like, it's fine. My parents aren't going to read it. And 10 people are going to buy this book. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was like, oopsies. <laughs> then <laughs> Two and a half million people you, are buying it. Uh, mm -hmm. I know. And it's been, an int it's been interesting because my parents now come to so many shows. My dad toured with me while I was um, in India, touring India a couple of years ago. And um, they are extremely supportive, even with the elements they might not understand. Like I'm, there's pieces I'm like going on for four minutes about an orgasm and sex. Yes. And my dad's what in the I'm audience. Talking about. And what does he say? We, does he we just avoid it? it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just has to <laughs> avoid it. I know. Well, cause I, I remember when I was doing Dancing with the Stars, I was on Ellen, I brought my parents and they showed I was in the Allure nude issue. Now, I'm not someone who would ever pose nude in my life, but this was like, you're nude, but nobody sees anything. Like yeah. it's, it's like I'm laying in a bed and all you see is just a little hump of my butt, right? My dad fumed in the audience. You saw him literally turn red like a lobster. And he, I mean, if he could have beaten me, I think that day he would have, like, he just was so angry and embarrassed. And I had so many moments where- That would be my dad. Yeah, yeah. like we were on Howard Stern once. Well, I mean, many times, a lot of embarrassing times. He was fuming then. So it was like a lot to have to overcome. So yeah, I can imagine, mm. and this is where I'm going with this, like you're talking yeah, about orgasms yeah. on stage and your dad, <laughs> I mean- they kind of either get mad and try to talk us out of it because that's what they, the only recourse they can have. But then eventually they know they can't control us and they just succumb. They know. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's like, we've never, ever talked about it. My dad is, he's like, it's art, you know, it's art. And I think it's like interesting because like, I think he looks around and he's like, well, there's like, 2,000, 3,000 people here who are like screaming. So he's like, 
I might just not understand. Like, and he just goes with it. And like, that's a blessing to be mm-hmm. honest. I don't even want to have a conversation about it with my dad. <laughs> of course. And so, um, but I, I totally like when I was on tour with him, I, I was like, cause you know, growing up, I was like, you know, I never wore like short dresses in front of him, like little things like that. And suddenly I'm like, you know, wearing like backless this and that. And it was uncomfortable, but I think my dad and was like, wait, there's, there's no controlling this. And he said that he's like, whatever it is like working through you, like, I can't, like, I'm not going to get in the way of that. And like, you just have to do you. And like, I'm not responsible for whatever magic you create. It's like a blessing. And like, all we can do is support you. And so fingers crossed, but I still get like last night I was on WhatsApp sending my family pictures. And then I was like, can't send this, can't send this, can't send this because I'm half naked in all of these. And then the girls who are with me, they're like, but like, you're posting this on Instagram. I'm sure they must see it. I'm in denial. <laughs> I'm dead. I think this is so funny. But I also think that it's something that other children of immigrants have to hear because a lot of people just fall in line because they don't know that there might be another side or there's pain that has to happen to get to the other side. Like my dad disowned me for almost two years for dating my husband because he wasn't Greek. Mm. And, and so there was pain. I had to set boundaries and I had to let him know, like I'm my own person and that you raised me well and you have to trust my decisions. And eventually everything worked out. Now they love him more than they love me, but that's a whole different story. But I think that, you know, a lot of us, even if you're not first gen, feel like we have to just stay in the box that our family, our community, and our friends want us to stay in. And just sitting here talking to you about this, I feel like this tension bubble that we're having to just thinking about (laughs) moving around them and how to be us, but there's this bubble in the middle and just we're like, yeah, we're going to burst it. (laughs) Oop, it's gone. And now we just all have to deal with it. And then you can really be the highest form of yourself, mm. like the truest expression of yourself. And then it is that gift that's not just for you, for them, but for everybody else to see. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the bubble is like in, in here. Yeah. And it's, it is like, yeah, I think um, I often say, I don't think I could have done what I did at 21 if I couldn't do it right now. I I just couldn't. I think like I, I'm not as innocent as that or naive as I used to be. Now I kind of know the consequences, but then it was like so much easier, but it is so important. And like, another thing I want to say is the parents and the community, like they, yeah, they might be like, just like with your parents, they, eventually you might hopefully figure out a way for them to come with you or you find a path to make it work. And if it doesn't work, then you set the boundaries, but you have to live in your highest form and stay true to yourself. Yeah. Otherwise you'll wilt. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to ask, so how old are you now? Is that okay to ask you? Yeah, I'm 29, 29 and I'm turning 30 in a month. Ooh, or less than a month. Yeah. <laughs> exciting. Um, so I'm 44 and my relationship with my parents, I would say probably when my mom got sick, shifted a lot where we just all became adults and we just became people. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're still mm-hmm. family. We're, you know, parent, kid, whatever. But that's when we started getting to joke about things that were super inappropriate and you would never think you would talk about in front of your parents. So someday you'll probably get there if you haven't already. I have not. (laughs) But I mean, for us, I think my mom getting brain cancer really just threw everything out the window because I was like, comedy Mm -hmm. must rule and whatever it takes to make us laugh. So at first Mm -hmm. they would be horrified when I'd say Mm -hmm. something inappropriate or whatever. And then they thought it was hilarious and we would just all laugh. I'm like, if the people in our community could hear what we're saying right now, they would completely like be done with us. They would be like, (laughs) they lost it. They're crazy. They're disgusting. But you have to do what you have to do to get through. When you have to survive something and thrive, you gotta pick some, some things. Yeah, you have to laugh through it for sure. For sure. That's so funny. That does remind me. Um, Recently, I've just been asking my mom 
because like you know they grew up in Punjab in the um 60s and 70s and um and uh yeah I'll be like so like what was it like with you and dad for the first time and she just gets so red she gets (laughs) so mad and she's like you're disgusting how dare you even ask me that question and she'll like cuss me out for a bit and then she'll be like we didn't even know what we were doing he didn't know I didn't know they just threw us in a room and stuff (laughs) happened and then I'm pretty sure I was conceived the first time they ever had sex oh my god I was born literally nine months later so and I'm just like, mom, that's so weird. I You're mean, so weird. you've gone to places I haven't gone to yet. I mean, I don't know my mom now to ask her that question. She's probably really grateful from above right now that I never got the chance. <laughs> but, and um, my mom ever heard me or knew that I was saying this on a podcast, she would yeah, be so pissed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, so what really got you into poetry? I... I was first, like drawing was my first love and looking back at my sketchbooks from high school, I would have these drawings and then in the top left corner, I would always, for some weird reason, I would always write words. It was like the drawing was never enough and I was always writing words in the top left corner. And uh, To explain the drawing? drawing, Not explaining the drawing, but it was like, let me say things that the drawing the drawing can only say this much and I need the whole piece to say this much. So this much the words need to say. And um, then I was randomly came upon this local event that was happening about the Sikh genocide went and I saw these incredible Sikh artists who were maybe a decade older than me. They're on stage, they're singing, they're rapping. And my whole world changed because up until that point, I never saw people in my community doing and expressing art in that way. And I was like, this is amazing because I love hip hop and I love music, but I've never seen us do that. And um, I I followed this. uh, I followed the organization. They were having an open mic. I went to the open mic. I didn't even know that what I'd written, I wasn't calling it a poem. I wasn't calling it a spoken word piece. I just wrote something. It was horrible. I was like typical teenage poem, mad at the government, don't even know what I'm talking (laughs) about, but I just sound like angry about something. So I go up and uh, I perform the piece and it was so life changing because there's like maybe 50 people, not even 50, there was like 25 people in the room. But to be on a stage and have my voice heard was something shifted inside of me because I grew up extremely shy quiet and just not very happy but this was the first time I felt like I was being listened to and after the event all these folks they're like literally a decade older than me they surround me and they're like you were amazing and you need to come back in the poster community and so much like that you know community organizing everyone's really supportive and I was like wow like this much love for me and I kept going back and I kept going back and I eventually started focusing less on the visual art and more on the poems because I just, it just felt more powerful and it was so much louder and it was so much more in your face. And that was what I loved about it. And it was just a hobby. And I was performing all around town. When I went to university, I would do classes. And then on weekends I would go and like do little things. And um, I don't know, one thing led to another without me having any expectations. And here we are. Wow. So were you nervous when you were on stage? Do you get nervous when you're on stage? Oh my gosh. Yes. I used to be so nervous. And when I was in a teenager, I would perform, I wouldn't memorize my pieces, um, but I would have my little pages and then I would, I, I couldn't even address the audience. Like I would just go on I'm not even saying, hello, how are you? I just go right into the poem. And when I'm in the poem, I'm great. I feel good. And then I, by the time I'm done, I I don't even wait for the audience to clap and I would run off. And then when I would run off, 
people would be like, oh my God, you're so precious. Like your hands were just <sighs> shaking the whole time. And I was like, oh no. And that's actually why I started wearing long gowns because I was so tired of everyone telling me that they could see my knees just quivering for the whole show. <laughs> oh my God. And I was like, well, you know, you will never see that again because now I'm just going to cover my knees. Um, the worst is the I hand would... shaking. I had a, I think who was the last person Dr. Oz asked me to speak at his Hollywood star f- on the walk of fame. This is like six months ago or something like that. And my hands were shaking. No and way. Are you after serious? all these years, totally yeah. shaking, but I'll teach you my secret to now what's worked for me. And I, I haven't since. So I had to speak at this event, um, in May and it was like all the top speakers in the world. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to be the total fail in this. Like, this is what they get paid, you know, millions of dollars to do. I'm going to, I'm going to be the weakest link. I was so nervous, but I had to come through for my friend because he had come through really big for me. And so I put something together. And when you talk about kind of like something working through you, um, just before I went out, I meditated. So this was like key number one. I don't know. You, you maybe you meditate. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I meditated and I made a very clear intention. I was like, I was like, I want to do my best, best, best today. And then I go, nah, I want to be the best there ever was on that stage today. I just want to be the best just this once. And I don't know where that came from, but it came from there. And then I remembered something, my friend who I was there for, had said in his speech, and he said, my confidence comes from my intention. And I held that so tight. And I was like, okay, my intention is to go out there and to get to get people to hear my message about taking control of your health and really taking it into the highest of considerations. And that's my intention. And I went out there and when I, you know, I'm in it and it felt really good. And it was the first time I wasn't shaking. I wasn't, you know, nervous. I was like flowing. Everything felt so good. Mm. I could take my pauses. I could have my time with it. I could have fun. I could, I I was playing in there. And then when I was running off stage, like you said, literally running off stage, he's like, wait, no, look, they're giving you a standing ovation. And then my friend met me right off the curtain. He goes, he's like, sister, he's like something supernatural just happened. He goes, that was the best speech I've ever heard in my life. Wow. And I was like, Holy shit. So now that's my secret. I share with you in case you still need a little something to help you with your nerves. Because anytime I have to do something like that now, I use the same formula and it works every time. Wow. Thank you. Also, I'm shocked that you get nervous still. Like that makes me feel like such a, that's so Cause I see you and I'm like icon. Like, I feel like you do everything in your sleep because you're just like <laughs> such a pro, but wow. Thank it's you. Like, I, I still get those. I mean, I used to feel like before on tour, when my tour would start, this was like pre COVID, the anxiety would be so much. It was like, I was like, it felt like, Oh my God, I've never been in labor, but I was like, it feels like I'm in labor. I need to get the baby out of me. I can't do this. And it would just, it wouldn't go away until I was at least five minutes into the, into the show. But this, it's been different this year. I mean, I think I just feel more confident and more powerful than I've ever felt, at least just with my show. And so I haven't felt that nervousness and that anxiety on the road, thank God, because it takes up a lot of energy. But when I, I'm doing something like speaking at an engagement or not doing my show. Yeah. Then I'm just like, why am I here? Everyone thinks I'm stupid. Everyone (laughs) thinks, why is she here? They're definitely thinking that. And then, you know. Yeah. Well, there's a vulnerability when you're not in your element. Like for you, I can see why you would be nervous in advance of like your first show, your second show, because you're just kind of, it's material that you're just putting out for the first time. Yeah. And you have to see how it lands. Once it lands, yeah. you can get your confidence from from the yes. success of that show, build off of that, and then you can flow because mm-hmm. now you feel confident that, oh, I've got something special that's resonating. Mm-hmm. Then you're good. But when you're just raw going out, out somewhere, vulnerable, it's a one-time thing, 
it's really scary because you don't know how it's going to be received. And you're up there like you're in the line of fire. Everyone's looking at you. So, yeah, I mean, I can host and do all those things and I can do that in my sleep blindfolded. Like that's that's where I, you know, feel super comfortable because mm. I've trained I've done it for so long. But right. the things that I'm not as strong at or don't have that muscle built, like public speaking, yeah. even though I've been public speaking forever, it's a different thing when it's not your every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that makes total sense. Yeah. I'm going to use that from now on. Then I'll get back to you on how the show changes. Yeah. No, it's really, really helpful. And it's funny because Lisa Bilio, I don't know if you're familiar with Lisa Bilio, um, her and her husband have um, a podcast shoot what's it called impact theory impact theory anyway mm. they um she was here for her book and she was like you get nervous she was she had the same reaction that's why i share it because you know i think again for me being honest um doesn't scare me and it helps other people yeah. so it makes everybody feel like oh it's not just me there's nothing wrong with me we're all nervous mm -hmm. and yeah i forget who it was but some big celebrity told me he's like if you're not nervous it means you don't care anymore Mm, yes, I've so, heard that one. So yeah, it, it just means we care. Um, yeah. So how has your life changed from the time Milk and Honey came out to where you're at now, um, over a decade later, technically, right? Um, almost eight years. Okay, almost eight years, almost a decade. Um, yeah, seven years, actually. Wow. I don't know. Time is weird. Okay, not almost a decade. I mean, <laughs> I thought it's it was so twenty. Weird. I thought it was at twenty, and you're twenty nine. So I was like, okay, almost a decade, but maybe not. Yeah, no. So I published when I was, I don't even, twenty one, right? I was published when I was twenty one, and then my um, See, she's like my me. publisher republished it later. But I'm thinking, I feel like it's the past. However many years has just it's a blur. I know. I'm it's horrible with that too. I'm, I makes it, me feel it, so good that I'm not the only one. I don't remember when yeah. I was married. I'm like, wait, what? It was on TV. Look it up, guys. I can't remember. I don't remember. Everything's a blur. <laughs> yeah, everything is a blur. And it's weird because I think I've now accepted that this is my life. Like even, even with two, the, like the first book was published. I still don't think I was an author. I was like, hey, do I go become a lawyer now? I don't know. Like order some else that books. Like that's, you know, that. My brain was just like, I couldn't see myself in this. And I think it was way after, like, during um, I published my second book. I was like, oh, this is my life. Like, I am, this is my profession and I can do this. And so it's been, I think I'm, with Healing Through Words, my fourth book now, I'm like really comfortable and really excited to continue to share I think in those earlier years in my early 20s for some weird reason and maybe it was things I was hearing from other people but I, I had this fear that my best work was behind me mm. because the pressure of all of the success was so debilitating that I I almost lost that magic that was working through me and I think I've spent so I spent my 20s since trying to convince myself that my best work is not behind me because that idea has been haunting me ever since I was published and ever since the success sort of came. And as I step into 30, like with full honesty, I can say that I'm so excited to meet like the woman I'm going to become at 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 and all of the masterpieces I'm going to create. Like it's just, going to get better and better and better um and that's a that, that's a very new place to be for me mentally but it's a really exciting place to be um because I think as women we we're constantly I mean this even this idea of stepping into your 30s as I tell people you know some people's reactions are like it's a number and then other people will be like oh but you'll be fine and I'm just like what is that you'll be fine what what is that? You know what I mean? And um, I think like it's, and now that I have, I feel so much more confident and powerful and I am excited for the future. It doesn't feel like life is dragging me. I'm kind of in control. 
<laughs> That's so cool. What, when you say like the pressure was debilitating, what was the pressure for you? <sighs> Trying to write a second book that was like a New York Times bestseller that would sell millions of copies. And because I don't even know how I did it the first time. Like I was just a kid who's like, oh, this poetry thing, let me post some of it on Tumblr and Instagram and here, ooh, people like it, cool. And then I like sat in my dorm and like put together this book. And, you know, even till this day, when I see it in bookstores, it's the weirdest thing because it just brings me back to like being in like with my roommates and like cutting out these poems and like doing the whole thing. Um Sorry, I lost the question. The pressure, like what was the pressure? So so the second book is with a publisher now and you probably have a big, you know, deal that you have to now fulfill and you've got deadlines. It's a different vibe. Yeah. Whereas the first one, that magic, I felt like something was working through me. And with the second one, that something was gone. Whatever it was, just... Because of that pressure. So then what happened with the second book? So then what happened with the second book was I signed my contract in October, November, 2016. And it was a two book deal. So book two and book three, I had to give them. And uh, so I signed it in October and they said that the manuscript was due in February. That's just a couple months. And so I was like, cool, 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 cool. (laughs) I didn't really... uh, spend the rest of the year working on it but I remember I was it was January 2017 and I was like whoa I have a manuscript due in two months I locked myself in a room in San Diego and I just wrote and I wrote and I wrote in like the most punishing way like I would spend eight to twelve hours a day at my desk writing and that was the opposite of how I wrote the first one the first one was just like me surrounded by women my best friends surrounded by all of this energy that you have you know when you're like on campus and you're talking to your peers and you're having all of these new exciting and also horrible experiences for the first time as a college student and um the poetry came so naturally from those interactions and I think it's not my style to be sitting at a desk and writing and writing and writing. And my body became physically sick. I couldn't digest food. I would have these like migraines that would last for 72 hours. I couldn't move out of bed. I was just, my nervous system was just wrecked. And um, I finished the book and I'm really proud of the book. Um, I, But that book really almost took my life. Mm. Like it really just by the end of it, I was deeply depressed, extremely suicidal, and just was like, what the hell am I doing? It didn't feel like my life was mine anymore, because I was just like, trying to hold on to the success as somebody who comes from an immigrant family who didn't have a lot. And suddenly, you know, and it didn't happen overnight. But then suddenly we had something and I could feed my family and I could give them something, you know, I just was so scared to lose it Mm -hmm. that I put my entire like health on the back burner to keep going and going and going. Wow. So did that book do as well as milk and honey? It actually did do as well. I don't know if it's sold as much as milk and honey, but it, it, it has like performed now I have outperformed in terms of like money, mm-hmm. oh, milk and honey. And um, I, I think like that's the book that Adele recently was like, this is the book that I would bring on a desert island in the podcast that she was in. And so I heard that. That's it, so funny. Yeah. You just reminded me of that. Yeah. <laughs> when she said that, I was like in tears. I was like, girl, I almost you died. What that means? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it still succeeded, but, but you saw the difference in the experience. And, and mm-hmm. so what did you do with the third book? Did you still deliver a third book for them? I, I did deliver a third book. Um, I think with the sun and her flowers, because milk and honey, milk and honey was so 
successful in the ways that the publishing industry didn't think a book of poetry could be. I was criticized constantly in interviews and all of that. Well, your book isn't real literature because it's too accessible. Like that word accessible was sort of weaponized against me consistently. And so I think that added to the pressure because suddenly I was like, no, no, no. I have to prove myself to all of these people. I have to like prove that I can be smart and talk about more than just my feelings. And that's why I was like diving into so many other immigrant stories and all of that. And then with the third book, once I learned that this is not about, like, I don't have to prove myself to anybody and I have to keep walking my path with the third book. I decided that if Milk and Honey was such an amazing experience and writing this on flowers was so horrible, I wanted Homebody to at least meet in the middle. And um, I wanted to kind of save my relationship with writing because I had, go- I had started to become so triggered by it. I was like, if I can just get to a point where I can start to enjoy this again, I'll be happy. So did you ask them for extended deadlines or anything like that? Um, I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah. Yeah. And now the fourth book, how did that go? Did you do it with a publisher or are you doing it on your own? Um, I did it with my publisher. So it's funny because like once I got, once the third book came out, I felt so free. I felt like this new door opened up for me because now there was no contract you know, with that book two, book three deal, because they were like a joint thing Mm -hmm. that was hanging over me for years. But with third book done, I was like a free birdie. And it's funny because the moment I became free, the ideas just Mm. started coming and suddenly there was healing through words book four. And then suddenly I'm like, you know, illustrating a children's book. And I'm like trying to write this and that because it's like, there was no, I think I was, I just don't function well under contract and deadlines. It's too much. And so that's my new rule. You'll get the book when you get the book, if you're going to get the book. Yep. And if not, then cool. I love it. <laughs> but I, I am excited about this one because it's not just poetry. Um, I want to empower my readers because they look at my, they look to my words to give them comfort. And now what I'm trying to do is tell them that the words you have the words, you can write the words like that bring you comfort and make you feel powerful. And like, this is my tool to help you do that. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more. Uh, This book is, it's for anyone who wants to maybe add writing into the, their self-care practice. Um, It's kind of, it uses writing And it helps you do a lot of self-exploration through that. So I started creating these writing writing exercises a couple years ago when I was feeling intense writer's block. And then um, COVID happened. And then I started to do those writing exercises on Instagram Live. And sometimes 10,000 people would join me for the hour and a half and do the exercises with me. And that's what inspired Healing Through Words. I realized that so many of my readers are writers not professionally, maybe a lot of them are, um, they are published poets, but then a lot of them just love writing. And so this is kind of my gift to them. Um, there's over like 69 writing exercises and they're all unique and they're all different. And I hope that by the end of it, maybe somebody will have their own first book or like, you know, a series of songs or just find that they too can be creative because I've always been so people always say this, like anytime I'm like, Oh, like you could probably, you should do this or you should do that. Like suggesting different creative ventures. People will be like, no, I'm not creative. And I mm. just feel like, but in my eyes, every human being is creative. Like we are creative by nature. You know? We all but have a left West, brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in the West, I feel like there's this idea that you can either be creative or you can be logical, but you can't be both. Mm-hmm. And so healing through words will hopefully um, ease people into the idea that they can be creative. I like that. I also like that you're basically helping them find their voice through the exercises. Mm. 
Mm. Right. Mm. A lot of people don't mm-hmm. have their voice. They don't know it. They wouldn't even know where to look for it. So I can tell that through these exercises, you'll be finding it. Um, and uh, I think that's really cool. Thank you. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what happens when it comes out. <laughs> I love hearing the journey of the the books because um, I had a book deal and after my call with them, I just felt ugh. like, I just felt like this isn't the right thing to do. I don't want the deadlines. Mm-hmm. I don't want the pressure. Um, there was a lot of things like that just didn't feel right. So I was like, yeah, no, I don't think this is going to happen. And I'm going to write it when I feel it. So it's, mm. I think it's, uh, it's really powerful to know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And sometimes you only learn it through, through the process, right? But then not yeah. ignore it when you've gone through the process. So if it doesn't work yeah. for you, don't keep doubling down and, you know, doing it that way. You had to fulfill your contract. Um, I wasn't mm-hmm. sure if you were going to cut the contract at some point and be like, okay, mm-hmm. but... um but it really is important to know what works, how you work best, because there is that flow that comes when, you know, you have your freedom to to do it the way mm. you want to do it. Because the way they want you to do it is they only know the way that's been done. So yeah. there are so many new ways to do things. And it's going to take you to be that one that has the courage to step forward and say, yeah, but I believe in this or mm. this is what I really genuinely want to share. And it's hard because at the same time, you still might fail because maybe it isn't polished well enough or maybe you aren't as talented as you think. Who knows? Like there's mm-hmm. going to be the in-betweeners, but you still got to try and you'll never Absolutely. know unless you try. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's it's a tough journey paving new paths. It is a tough journey. It's a beautiful journey, though. Mm-hmm. It really mm-hmm. is. Um <laughs> There was um, there was another question I had, but now I can't remember how, how we touched on it. So I'm going to wait on that. Kelsey, I'm going to let you jump in because I know you're probably burning with questions in there. And burning. I think you are someone who writes your kind of daily journal, right? You know, I do. I need to get back <laughs> into it. I haven't, I used to be like very religious with it and I haven't in a minute and I need to get back into it. But I was telling Rupi when we were talking before, homebody, I have it right here. It's like, I feel like something, it's a book that I can turn to when I'm feeling some sort of way and it makes me feel so much better. It's so therapeutic for me to read it, Rupi. So I'm really excited to get this new book because like I want to channel my own words too. Like exactly yeah. like you're saying, it's like, I love that you're empowering us to like, no, we have that in us too. So I'm Queen, very excited. Are you 28 now? Yeah, 28. You're 28. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... I, I wonder if, um, Ruby, you feel like in your 20s, because I kind of, I feel like I see where you guys are at in your 20s. There's so much confusion. There's so much inner pain of like, because yeah. you have to do so much. You have to find love. You have to find success. You have to do all these things. And there's just a tornado of shit. Truly. And you don't know how to like, <laughs> You can't even tie your own shoelaces still. Like you're like all all over the place. And I feel that tornado for you guys. And and so I wonder if you've had kind of that moment where you realize it or if you have any wisdom to share with your 20 somethings. And then Kelsey, we're coming back to you because only because no, something just that. came up I and I that. felt it. And no, it's kind of where I was going. So it's perfect. Okay. Do I have wisdom? Yes. Yeah, Rupi. <laughs> I'm none. <laughs> Are you still in oh the tornado? I, I'm i near the end of the tornado. But like I was thinking about when you said, oh, you completed your contract. Like I was, you said, I wondered if you would cut it. Thought didn't even occur to me. Like I didn't even know who I was when I signed that contract. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I just was like, what's happening and going and going and going. And I'm such a timid personality and just could never even say no to anything. And like, I would never want to let anyone down. And so I would say that the tw- my twenties were like a tornado, hurricane, mess, mm-hmm. intense, all of the horrible adjectives. 
and it went by so quickly and it's confusing. And I think it's so, I just want to say that. I just want to be honest because I would look at other people and be like, it seems like everybody else is having a great old time. (laughs) And I am the person who is not enjoying any of it. And yeah, I just want to share that. It's, it's, the more that I share that it was a mess, uh, at least when people share that with me, it helps. Um, and then eventually your feet, you do find that ground and your feet do land. And I, I am feeling, I am feeling that ground a little bit and like that confidence to take control of my life and uh, mm. not make decisions based off of fear, but out of what I actually want. Yeah. By the way, the 30s are the hangover for the 20s, just so you know. It's still going to be tornado. There's still tornado in there. <laughs> At least there was for me. I'm just telling you, it's just you get a little smarter. Like you're every year we're getting better and better, guys. Like yeah. we just we just keep grabbing these nuggets. That's what we do here on this show every day. It's all about getting the nuggets to make life better and easier mm. and and grow and continue to like expand our minds, but it's we're we're the 20s as messy for you uh in some ways um i had my my life partner in kevin so that part i didn't have to worry about right like so the love thing was was covered um and i had my best friend with me on the journey but you know trying to handle success and and everything that comes with it because it's it's like a, a runaway train. There's so much. And you have mm-hmm. to learn how to be the CEO of a company, how to have employees at 22 years old. Like, how the hell do you do that? I was a kid oh. employing kids thinking they were supposed to know everything because every Thanks. adult's like, well, the assistant profile, they should be good at this, 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 and this. And I'm like, okay, I need a super mega robot. And then they'd suck. And I didn't know why they sucked because they were kids. How could they create my travel profile if they've never traveled? How could they do all this? So it only took me till I got a brain tumor and everything. <laughs> stopped to be like, what the fuck was I thinking? What was I subscribing to? And now I tell every adult, my like, guys, you're expecting a 21 year old to run your company. Like you might find that one gem and that's like, you know, way wise beyond their years, but come on now, they're going to make mistakes because they don't even know how to run their life yet. And so mm-hmm whether it's through that or just handling the schedule and being able to know how to do all these deals and, and which deal is right and what's, what's wrong and what people to work with, what people not to. And it's like, and, and it's just, it's a lot. And so Mm -hmm. it was a lot for me, like I said, until God just was like, okay, bitch ain't going down. We got to go hard on her. And so Mm -hmm. I went down and I was like, (laughs) Oh, I get it now. Okay. Yeah. Slow down a little bit. I got to, smell the flowers. You know, when you think of everything being a blur, you're never present because you're always going yeah. forward thinking, okay, advanced planning, got to get ready for this, got to get ready yeah. for that. I'm never here. I'm with Jay-Z yeah. talking. I'm not with Jay-Z talking. I'm already in in India yeah. or Africa or wherever I'm going tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I always was living in the future, constantly problem solving for like thinking like problem solving for things that weren't problems yet yes. because I was like so scared. Yes. I was like, fine. We're going to do A, B, C, D. I have all the plans ready. And like, it just, yeah, was not present for years. And then COVID sort of happened. And I was like, well, I really need to figure out how I, I want to do this after the world opens up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not making decisions from fear is a, big one Mm. and meditating so you can be present and realizing Mm -hmm. you don't have to do it all now and trusting the universe that it is going to happen the way it's supposed to happen. You didn't plan out. I'm going to be a a spoken word poet doing live tours and writing all these best-selling books and illustrating them and all of that. I didn't plan where I was going to be. I knew I was going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I did have some kind of, psychic moments of some things that I saw, but I didn't know how the hell a girl from two immigrant parents who were janitors cleaning nightclubs all over Boston were going to, was going to go where I thought I was going. I, I knew, but I didn't know. And then mm. it all just unfolds. So I always say like, work, commit to working hard. 
I was going to outwork anybody. That was never a question. I was going to outwork everybody Mm. and anybody, and I was going to be a good person. And, um, and I just trusted, and I would say to God every day, God, just take me where I'm supposed to go. And I still do that because I still don't know where the hell I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So makes me so emotional to hear, hear all of this from you. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Well, I'm here for you, Queen, anytime you need help and, oh. and a big sister. Um, <laughs> Kelsey, I'm going to go back to you because I know you have stuff to ask. And I just felt your tornado in there and I had to go for it. <laughs> okay. I just want to know, I'm so curious, Ruby, because I know earlier, which I feel like kind of just ties in so well to what Maria was asking you. You were saying that you, hold on, I wrote it down. Oh, you you feel like you're finding your confidence and power now. And I want to know mm. how and like what you've been doing or if there's any, you know, self-care non-negotiables or I know Maria's like her meditations, her everything, you know, what are the mm. things that you've been doing recently that you feel like have been helping you find that confidence yeah. and power? I think that med- meditation really, really, really helped. And I'll be honest, it's something that I did a lot through COVID and I've lost that practice since. And it's something that, I I, I'm working towards getting back to, but what I'm currently doing that's really helping is, I mean, after it was a struggle, but finally finding a therapist that, that just the chemistry is right. And it feels really good. Uh, And my kind of go-to thing is exercise, like giving myself that endorphin rush. And I've just become more relaxed because I've seen what being hypercritical has done to me. It gave me nothing. It just made me hate myself. And so now when I walk off the stage, I don't obsess over the things that, you know, I wish I said better. I wish I did better because it's just not worth it. I think especially when finally coming out of that, depression and not having these suicidal thoughts anymore I think it was just like a big wake-up call and I was like I never want to go back to that place again I never want to go back again and so now I can sense it because you know depression is one of those things just because you got out doesn't mean you won't go back in I can sense it and that's when I'm like no 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 nothing is more important I've worked so hard I've worked so hard I deserve peace of mind at the least and so I was just writing a poem about that today. Like it's my peace of mind is way too priceless to give up mm. for work and Slack messages and emails and whoever the hell wants anything else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love that too. Peace of mind is priceless. So Ruby, good. thank you so much for being with us today. I hope thank we can be you. live with you at some point when you're in LA. Um, yeah, that would be amazing. Kelsey, I, well, I didn't get to see you, but hi. Hi. <laughs> you're hi, so lady. sweet. <laughs> oh, you're amazing. Thank you for everything, truly. So, yeah, have- you as well. All right, ladies, that okay. was lovely. That was lovely. She's amazing. Great, that, great booking, yeah. Queen. Thanks. I really thought that you guys, I always love those conversations too. I felt like you guys would connect, but then also you would take kind of that like mentor Maria, like give advice. And I love when you get into that place and get a play also, because we learn so much through you listening to you give her advice. You know, it's like, it's, I, I really love those conversations. Thanks queen. You're welcome. Well, I know what it's like. She's in, in the thick of it. It's funny. Like my friend, Dimitri, he's in the thick of it. He's a couple years behind me. So I'm like, okay, here's what the road ahead shows. Like, so let's, let's fix this and that da, 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 without, you know, cause the other thing I have to be careful of is robbing everybody of their journey too. But, um, but you know, the advice is there. They use it if they do or not, but, um, but she's, she's great. And I really loved hearing the journey of like the purity of, of writing her first book to the just visceral opposite experience of the other ones. And, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, writing books is really, really hard. Um, really hard. So I haven't done it yet. Did you feel that at all or any of that sort of like the sticky hard with an, any of your three? Yeah, I did. Um, Mine are different because they're not art, right? So, so the first book, it was really challenging because I had deadlines and I just couldn't meet them because it was my, I said, listen, first of this, like, I've never done this before and I'm not hiring a ghostwriter. So you're not going to get that, like, you know, 
I mean, ghostwriters, what they supposedly do is they have a couple conversations with you and then they go write it and then you get a book and it's like, oh, this is me, I guess. I couldn't do that. So I was like, you have to be patient with me because I don't know what I'm doing. And so, you know, it was definitely a messy process and um, they were as patient as they could be. And I'm really grateful for that. And then they told me I was writing a bad book. (laughs) And I was like, which they were wrong. So, so I say, I keep sharing that to keep reminding people that they're not always right. And by the way, not only were they not right, but it literally started that guide phenomenon that everyone followed after. So they would hand everybody my book and say, make your version because it was so successful. And so you know, not only was it solitarily successful, it became a franchise for all of these publishers to just copy. Um, so, you know, that's that. That's that. That's I that. love it though. It's amazing. Um, I have a fun little story to share Ooh, with you guys. Us. This is like the Easter egg at the end of the show, but you're gonna die. So I knew I had something to share at the top of the show and I couldn't remember it. But... This past weekend, Kevin and I were sitting um, outside having an early morning green tea and breakfast. And we're talking about the fact that we are nearing an implantation situation. So friends, keep it a secret, okay? Supposedly, our surrogate is great to go. And this is going to actually happen. Now, we've been here before, so I'm not getting too excited But the craziest thing happened because I said, Kevin, this is kind of do or die. Like it's been like 12 years of either trying with us or surrogates. And so I was like, we're really old and, you know, getting tired now. Like if we are going to pull the plug, we're going to pull the plug now. Like this is this is it. And as we're having that conversation, I see rustling in the tree, the magnolia tree in my yard. A lot of rustling. A stork flies out of my magnolia no tree way. to the tree across the street and sat at the peak. And I'm like, what? I mean, these massive wings. And I'm like, oh, holy shit. Never seen one in my life here before. 16 years, never seen one before. Don't even think they're indigenous or like part of California's wildlife, but whatever. And he sat at the top of the tree and Kevin and I were just sitting in awe and shock or shock and awe. And... I was like, oh, then I hear another rustle. I go, holy shit, I think there's another one. So it's rustling. I get the camera. The one at the peak of the tree flies off. I get the video of it. And then I don't know if the other one was in there for sure because I didn't physically see him, but it was the same kind of big rustle. It wasn't a squirrel. And it must have just gone the other way. I nearly like lost my shit. I could not believe this. Okay, your mom was like, never say that again. You right. are having these children right. and I will give you the biggest sign. Holy then, cow. Then we went um, we went and, and we're looking um, at some beach areas and there were storks everywhere. There was like a stork statues. Oh my God. Stork <laughs> statues everywhere. Oh. Everywhere I turned, it was another stork. I'm like, what the heck is happening? Oh my God. So I guess we're going to do this. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Wow. Isn't that crazy? Wow. So I was telling uh, Andrea, my trainer, wow. the story, she started crying. It was oh. really sweet. Um, and so, yeah, it was really, uh, really banana story. Anyway, wow. I had to share it. Don't tell anybody, guys. <laughs> don't tell I don't want anybody, anybody to know our timeline. It's oh. it's still private, but you guys are my fam. So. <laughs> I'm like crying that she was crying. That's, she, wow. Yeah, she's so sweet. So connected. Um, wow. So anyhow, that's my story. Uh, in the meantime, um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Ruby. If you did, let us know in the comments below on YouTube or hit us up on Apple Podcasts with a five-star review and, and share your thoughts. Um, we're really grateful for all of them. There are actually some really good ones we'll have to read this week. Did Yeah, we haven't read them in a while, but we got to start remembering to read those. So we'll read them in the next episode. Um, but thanks for being here with us. Thanks for being on this healing journey. And uh, remember, be nice people, make good choices and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you.
Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.